Today we will be talking about the trigeminal nerve. We will be discussing only V1 and V2 today, which is the ophthalmic and the maxillary branch. You'll notice on these slides that I have both my name and Professor Lamoureux's name. Professor Lamoureux taught head and neck anatomy for many years and was kind enough to share many photos with me. So I want to thank her for that. It's one of my favorite proverbs. Here's a question for you. Which system causes muscles to contract, stimulates glands to secrete, and allows for sensations such as pain and touch to be perceived? If you said the nervous system, you are correct. Let's quickly review the CNS, the central nervous system. It's composed of the brain and the spinal cord. The major regions of the brain are the cerebrum, which is the largest portion of the brain, and it coordinates sensory data and motor functions and its many aspects. The cerebellum is the second largest, and it produces muscle coordination, maintains muscle tone and posture and balance. We talk about the brain stem. We talk about the medulla, which is closest to the spinal cord, which is involved in the regulation of the heartbeat, blood pressure, and breathing. Pons connects the medulla and the cerebellum and higher brain centers. Cell bodies from the cranial nerve 5 and 7 are found in the pons. When we talk about the midbrain, we're talking about a relay station for, the, for hearing, vision, and motor pathways. Diencephalon thalamus and hypothalamus, these links link the nervous system to the endocrine system. Here's a question. An important structure containing nuclei involved in the regulation of sleep is the, the correct answer would be C, pons. This helps the regulation of sleep. Again, you may want to review pages 182 through 188 in your textbook to review the nervous system. So let's talk about the trigeminal nerve, cranial nerve number five, and it's the most important nerve to dentistry. It is a mixed nerve. It has sensory fibers to teeth, mucous membranes of the oral cavity, nasal cavity, and skin of the face. Motor branches are to the muscles of mastication. There are three main branches of the trigeminal nerve. Again, as I mentioned already, today we'll just be talking about the ophthalmic division, which is also referred to as V1. And this branch is sensory only and its exit point is the superior orbital fissure, which is part of the sphenoid bone. The maxillary division, which is V2, is also sensory only, and this exit point is the foramen rotundum. Remember, it is round, rotund. When you're at your max, you're rotund. The mandibular division is V3, and this is both sensory and motor, and its exit point is the foramen ovale, which is also part of the sphenoid bone. I believe you saw this slide last week. This is the exit points for the trigeminal nerve, the ophthalmic, maxillary, and mandibular. This nerve arises from the ventral surface of the cerebral pons. 
then travels forward and downward to a ganglion known as the trigeminal ganglion or the semilunar or Gasserian ganglion. At this point, the sensory fibers divide into three main branches and the motor root fibers become part of the mandibular division. Remember I mentioned that V1 and V2 are sensory only. V3, which is the mandibular division, has motor the, and it's part and it's for, excuse me, the muscles of mastication. So when we talk about the ophthalmic division, V1, afferent nerve, it is the smallest and it's sensory only. Again, its exit point is a superior orbital fissure. It has three main branches, the nasociliary, which is the nasal mucosa, ethmoid and sphenoid sinuses, skin of nose and eyeball, the frontal, for the conjunctiva, skin of the eye, forehead, part of scalp. It has two divisions, the superorbital, which is from the forehead and anterior scalp, and the supertrochlear, which is from the bridge of the nose and medial portions of the upper eyelid and forehead. Both of these exit the skull through the foramina of the same name. The lacrimal, which is responsible for the production of the lacrimal fluid or tears, innervates the lacrimal gland. Here's just a picture of the divisions of the, the branches, I should say, of the ophthalmic division. Here's just another picture. And yet another one. You can see that V1 is for the nose and forehead. So if we review the ophthalmic division, it leaves the skull through the superior orbital fissure, it's sensory nerve only, and it includes the tip of the nose, which is the nasociliary branch the eyes, which is lacrimal, and the forehead, which is frontal. That's it in a, in a nutshell. Now let's talk about the maxillary nerve, which is V2. This is also sensory only. It innervates the maxillary teeth, bone, periodontium, and associated soft tissues, mucous membranes of the maxillary sinus, and the nasopharynx, the hard and soft palate, skin of the lower eyelid, upper lip, side of nose, and part of the tonsillar area. Here just shows the branches. If you think about zygomatico-temporal, it makes sense that it would go from the zygomatic area to the temporal area. Zygomatico-facial, the cheek. And when we first started in anatomy and physiology, excuse me, in head and neck anatomy and physiology, talked about words like posterior, superior, alve alveolar. Posterior would mean in the back, superior, upper, alveolar, bone. Nasopalatine, think about nose and palate. Greater and lesser palatine, middle and anterior alveolar. It would be middle and anterior superior alveolar branches, be more appropriate and the infraorbital, which would be below the orbit. The maxillary nerve leads through the foramen rotundum. It enters the, terocal, the tero, terocopalatine fossa, where it divides into main branches. The nerve trunks is formed in the pterygopalatine fossa by the convergence of many nerves. Pterygopalatine branches are 
two short trunks that pass through the pterygopalatine ganglion. This ganglion lies just inferior to the maxillary nerve in the pterygopalatine fossa. This ganglion is a relay station for parasympathetic fibers of the facial nerve. There are five branches on the other side of the ganglion. Lateral nasal mucosa of the nasal cavity, nasopalatine, greater and lesser palatine, and the pharyngeal, which is the nasal part of the pharynx. Here's that ganglion, that relay station. Okay, let's talk about the different branches. Here's the nasopalatine nerve. This enters the nasal cavity through the sphenopalatine foramen. It crosses the roof of the nasal cavity, travels along the septum, then floor of the nasal cavity. It passes through the incisive canal and enters the oral cavity through the incisive foramen. Think about the lingual of teeth 8 and 9. There's the incisive papilla. Right underneath the incisive papilla, that's the papilla that can get burnt when you're eating pizza. Underneath there is the incisive foramen. The right and left nerves enter through the same opening. This supplies the mucous membrane and the lingual gingiva of the premaxilla. The premaxilla is canine from canine. If you remember correctly, I said for the most part head and neck anatomy makes sense. Mental, the mental region is the chin. You have the mental foramen. On, coming out of that is the mental nerve. However, this is one of the exceptions. The nasopalatine nerve comes out of the incisive canal. But if you look at the picture, it's right there under the nose and part of the palate. So again, it enters the oral cavity through the incisive foramen and it's called the nasopalatine nerve. Here's just another picture of that. Now let's talk about the greater palatine nerve, also known as the GP nerve. This is an afferent nerve for the posterior hard palate and posterior lingual gingiva. This descends through the pterygopalatine canal, enters the oral cavity through the greater palatine foramen. It innervates the palatal mucosa and bone for the premolar's back, as well as the lingual gingiva. This communicates with terminal branches of the nasopalatine nerve. Here is the greater palatine foramen, and it runs forward. To locate it, it's three to four millimeters in front of the posterior border of the hard pal palate. It's also one centimeter towards the palatal midline, just distal to the second molar. This nerve runs in an anterior direction where it communicates with the nasopalatine nerve. To locate this nerve, what you would use, you could use a cotton applicator. And once you come, as I said, three to four millimeters in front of the posterior border of the hard palate and about a centimeter towards the palatal, palatal midline, your cotton applicator actually will dip into that area to let you know that that's that you're right there at the greater palatine foramen. That'll be helpful when you're giving that injection. The lesser palatine nerve exits through the lesser palatine foramen, runs in a posterior direction, and innervates the soft palate and palatine tonsils. I'm going to go to the previous slide and show you 
the foramen for the lesser palatine nerve is right here. So when you're anesthetizing and you want to anesthetize this area, greater palatine, if you go to the lesser palatine, you'd be anesthetizing the soft palate and the tonsils, which is what we do not want to do. Hope you didn't get dizzy right there. The pharyngeal nerve is a small nerve which supplies the nasal part of the pharynx. There are some other branches of V2, the mandibular division, we need to talk about. The zygomatic nerve, which, which leaves the maxillary division in the pterygopalidine fossa. There's has two branches, the zygomaticofacial and the zygomaticotemporal. Other branches are the posterior superior alveola and the infraorbital nerve, which has two branches, the middle superior alveola, anterior superior alveola, and well, the terminal branches. So let's talk about these. The zygomatic nerve travels in an anterior direction. It enters the eye orbit through the inferior orbital fissure. It has two branches, a small branch, which is the zygomaticofacial, which innervates the skin of the cheek, and then the zygomaticotemporal, which is the skin of the temporal region. Kind of makes sense if you look at the words where it would innervate. Posterior superior alveolar nerve, or PSA. This travels along the infratemporal surface of the maxilla. This may have two trunks. One will remain external to the posterior surface of the maxilla. It enters the maxilla through several PSA foramina, which are on the maxillary tuberosity area that it innervates is the posterior of the maxillary sinus, the pulp, buccal bone, buccal gingiva, and periodontal ligaments of the maxillary molars, except for the mesial buccal root of the maxillary first molar. So here's the PSA, posterior superior alveolar nerve. There it is again in green. And notice that it does not innervate the mesial buccal root of the maxillary first molar. So if you're working on the first molar, you'd have to innervate both the posterior superior alveola and then the middle superior alveola. A dental plexus, we should talk about, is sensory endings of these larger nerves that supply individual roots, bone, and periodontal structures for each tooth. Sometimes you can innervate this area here for this area. So let's talk about the infraorbital nerve, which is an afferent nerve. It's also known as the I.O. It's a terminal branch of the maxillary nerve. It enters the orbit through the inferior orbital fissure. It follows the infraorbital groove to enter the infra infraorbital canal. It has two branches that split off inside the infraorbital canal. The ASA, anterior superior alveola, and the MSA, middle superior alveola. If you give an IO in infraorbital nerve block, an injection, you would also be anesthetizing the ASA and the MSA. And there's just a picture of, see the infraorbital nerve, it's called the infraorbital canal. Here is what the IO innervates. Notice the infraorbital foramen right here. Also note that if a nerve exits a foramen, it innervates the soft tissue. If it stays within the foramen, or 
goes into the foramen, into the bone, it innervates bone. The MSA nerve descends through the lateral wall of the maxillary sinus. This is also an afferent nerve of sensation, which includes, of course, pain. Its area of innervation is the middle of the maxillary sinus, the pulp, buccal bone, buccal gingiva of the maxillary premolars, and the mesial buccal root of the maxillary first molar. The MSA may be absent in some people. If this is the case, the area is innervated by the ASA and the posterior superior alveola, but mainly by the ASA. This will be important to you when you start to give local anesthesia. Note the green is the MSA, the middle superior alveola. Again, if you look at the area that it innervates, it also innervates the mesial buccal root of the maxillary first molar. Okay, let's talk about the ASA nerve, the anterior superior alveolar nerve, which descends through the anterior wall of the maxillary sinus. This also serves as an afferent nerve of sensation. Areas of innervation, anterior of the maxillary sinus, the pulp, buccal bone, buccal gingiva of the maxillary anteriors. Many times the ASA nerve crosses over the midline to the opposite side in the patient. This is important to consider when administering local anesthesia for maxillary anterior teeth and associated tissues. So again, just know the ASA oftentimes crosses over the midline. And note the green ASA as it's going towards the midline. And there is the area in which it anesthetizes, excuse me, innervates. I want to get to local anesthesia, obviously. Let's talk about the I.O. nerve and its terminal branches. I believe I had mentioned there are three terminal branches. Infraorbital nerve exits through the infraorbital foramen, which I showed you. There are three terminal branches. The inferior palpebral, which is the skin of the lower eyelid. If any of you have ever had anesthesia up in that area to perhaps work on Let's say the canine, you may have noticed that the skin of your lower eyelid became anesthetized. External nasal, skin on the side of nose, again, you may have noticed that got numb. And the superior labial, if you think about superior label, labial, you'll know it's the upper lip. Let's talk about a review of V2, the maxillary nerve. It's sensory only. It leaves the skull through the foramen rotundum of the sphenoid bone. It includes the upper teeth, nose, palate, mouth, cheek, and temporal region. Talk about the many branches. Zygomatic innervates the skin of the cheek. Infraorbital is the maxillary sinus, the anterior and middle maxillary teeth. Pterygopalatine is pharyngeal, greater, lesser, lesser, excuse me, and nasopalatine. The PSA is molars, the maxillary molars, except for the mesial buccal root of the first molar. MSA is bicuspids and the, and the mesial buccal root of the first molar on the maxilla. Remember that the MSA is absent in many people, or some people. ASA is the maxillary anterior teeth. Palatine, greater and lesser, are hard and soft palate. Greater palatine would be the hard palate, lesser is soft palate. Nasopalatine, which exits through the incisive foramen, is the lingual gingiva of the maxillary incisors. A good hint 
to remember, and this sounds better than when I said it, if a nerve exits a foramen, it is going to supply soft tissue in the oral cavity. So it comes out of the foramen, goes towards the soft tissue. It will innervate soft tissue. If a nerve enters a foramen, think about when the mandibular division enters the mandibular foramen. It is going to supply pulp, bone, and periodontal structures. I think this is a good place to stop. It's an awful lot of information. And next week, we'll talk about the third division, the mandibular division, and we'll do some review questions. Thank you.